Welcome to Sound Bites, hosted by registered dietitian nutritionist Melissa Joy Dobbins. Let's delve into the science, the psychology, and the strategies behind good food and nutrition. Hello, and welcome to the Sound Bites podcast. Today's episode is about misinformation and disinformation in food science and nutrition. How to think more critically about food and nutrition information in the news. And if you're a dietitian or a health professional listening, how to communicate more accurately and effectively about food, nutrition, and science. This is such an important topic and one that is much easier said than done that I created my Sound Science Toolkit years ago as a resource for dietitians and health professionals and the public as well. So I will put a link to that in my show notes if anybody is interested in checking that out. My guests today are Connie Dickman and Dr. Cami Ryan. They are co-authors, along with Tracy Oliver, of a paper published in the Journal of Nutrition in January 2023 titled Misinformation and Disinformation in Food Science and Nutrition, Impact on Practice. Welcome to the show, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. I'll give you a short introduction, and then I would love to hear more about your backgrounds. So Connie is a food and nutrition consultant in St. Louis, Missouri. She's a registered dietitian, former president of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, and current Academy PAC chair. Connie worked as a television nutrition reporter for close to 15 years, working for the NBC, CBS, and finally the Fox affiliates in St. Louis, Missouri. For 15 years, Connie was the voice of the Eating Right Minute, which aired on radio station WBBM in Chicago, where I live. And fun fact, Connie, I did a few of those commercials as well, which was a lot of fun. Connie is also the author of the Everything Mediterranean Diet book, All You Need to Lose Weight and Stay Healthy, and the book, Superfood Nuts. Cami is a social and behavioral scientist for Bear Crop Science. She's also a Bear Science Fellow and a professional affiliate with the College of Agriculture at the University of Saskatchewan. With a broad academic and professional background in social sciences and economics, Cami is particularly interested in studying the impact of dis- and misinformation in the marketplace and advocates for policy based on science-based evidence in the agriculture industry. She is a prolific researcher whose recent work focuses on how the attention economy shapes public opinion, regulatory decisions, and scientists' license to operate. Again, welcome to the show, both of you. I am so excited to dig into this paper with you. I do want our listeners to know that this episode is not sponsored, but as you both share more about your backgrounds, please share any disclosures that you have to note. And we might be submitting this episode to the Commission on Dietetic Registration for free continuing education credits for dietitians, diet technicians, and diabetes educators. Like I said, I would love to hear more about your backgrounds, um, particularly as it applies to the topic that we're discussing today and how you got interested in this niche, this topic, and yeah, anything you would love for us to know about your backgrounds. Connie, let's start with you. Thanks, Melissa. Appreciate you having us on today and letting us talk about this important topic. You know, in terms of background, I think it has always, to me, been about the science. I was trained through Washington University, and, you know, that's clearly a very strong science-grounded institution. And my dietetic internship director, Kathy McCluskey, who many dietitians know, was also very adamant about, we practice based upon the evidence, we practice based upon the science. So as I worked with clients through the years, and it's been a lot of years, um, as I worked with clients, and especially once I went back to WashU with the college population, the confusion of the client really became evident. The confusion about, well, one website says this and one says that, that I realized, you know, we need to do a better job helping people understand that not everything you read is accurate and how do you tell the difference? And how do we work with clients so that they feel comfortable about saying, I'm confused? And then it also became that ethical piece. So for me, it's the twofold, the consumer confusion and then that ethics of us as professionals. You know, what should we be doing to ensure that our clients 
are doing what they're comfortable with and in the best interests of their health. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. I know you have a long history of talking about ethics within our profession. So I'm, I'm really happy that we'll get to hear all about that today. Uh, and maybe this will be a part two because there's so much to talk about. Yeah, there is. But Dr. Cami Ryan, I would love to hear more about your background as well. Thanks, Melissa. Well, I first want to say it's been an absolute delight to work with Connie and Tracy on this paper. And I've worked in agriculture for more than 30 years. So I'm getting a bit long in the tooth, as we say, up in Canada and uh, have a bit of experience around this. And probably originally when I started out with my career, I was focused really on ag economics, a bit of psychology around business and organizational behavior, and a lot about sociology and understanding, you know, decisions in the field, how farmers make decisions about their production methods. I became interested in this space probably about the time that social media started becoming this part of our, what can I say, our virtual living rooms, where we started engaging in this space a little bit more regularly. And uh, I was teaching a class in the University of Calgary back in 2006 or 2007, and my students dragged me kicking and screaming into Facebook and I haven't looked back. And they did that because they wanted to do online learning. They wanted that methodology class to be very online engagement based. And it was good. And what I realized was that the conversations we were having about food and agriculture, because those two things are greatly intertwined, that those conversations weren't always based in evidence and science, and you could see what was going to happen on the horizon. And that actually, all of us that work in these spaces, these industries, uh, whether it's food, food science, whether we're registered dietitians or we work in agriculture, those conversations and those dialogues are going to impact perceptions of the work that we do as scientists and evidence-based advocates. So I was just really fascinated with the mechanism that was social media and really how we humans interact in that space. So that kind of was the driver for me. And I've been working around myth and disinformation probably and myth busting, you know, about agriculture and food probably for almost 20 years now. And it's been a fascinating space. I think at one time I was hoping, oh, no, we're going to fix this. And then you realize, no, you're never going to fix it. But I think that there's things that we can do as professionals, no matter where we work along the value chain, horizontally or vertically, that we can do to start um, to be part of those dialogues and to kind of direct people in different directions. I won't go on a little bit more, but I want to say that one of the most amazing things I learned, and I learned on one of your episodes, Melissa. Wow. Robin came in. You had an episode with her. And one of the things that she said in that episode was... Robin Flipsy? Yeah, Flipsy. And one of the things she said, and it just hit me, is she said, humans are the only animal that instinctually doesn't know what and how to eat. They have to learn mm. how to consume food. And I went, well, of course, Right. It's the same thing with information on the internet and on social media. So we have to learn that process. The problem is, is most of us don't think we have to learn anything. We just absorb it, right? Mm -hmm. So it becomes a little bit about what's your information diet and how are you managing, how are you moderating it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, that's fascinating. This conversation we're having today, we think about these things and we talk about these things, but I, I feel like your paper is a great opportunity to take that deeper dive because I think there's a lot of questions, you know, as dietitians and clinicians, we know we're supposed to be evidence-based, but how do we put that into practice? And I think your paper provides a really nice overview and details out the concepts. We're going to talk about critical thinking, which I talk about on the podcast all the time, and just kind of some of the nuts and bolts that people need to actually apply this in their practice. Before we move on, though, I do want to make sure that both of you disclose any disclosures that you have. I currently work as a social behavioral scientist for Bear Crop Science. I have been working for the company for almost 10 years. But prior to that, I was a public sector researcher uh, with the University of Calgary and the University of Saskatchewan. So I kind of have a mixed bag of a background in terms of some of the sectoral spaces I've worked in. Thank you. And I have to say, Abmi, you have such a strong online presence. 
that's how I first connected with you and just appreciate the work that both of you do in this space. Connie, do you have any disclosures? Yeah, it follows very similarly. Being based here in St. Louis, I have worked with the Monsanto Now Bear Group for a lot of years. And currently I am a member of the Bear Nutrition Expert Network, where our goal is to really try to clarify the science, the realities in the the food agriculture arena, because it is confusing. You know, you hear multitude of pieces of information. And as dietitians, we, of course, need to understand what really happens on the farm. You know, what does the farmer have to deal with as it relates to cost of seed, cost of animals, uh, feeding those animals, all of these variables. And, you know, it has been a real education for me to be involved with the Monsanto and Now Bear group in learning the realities of our food system. And that, I hope, has translated to what I've done with my clients so that that relationship piece, yes, I am on the Bayer Nutrition Expert Network, but it's a plus that I bring to the table. Absolutely. Yeah. And we aren't going to be speaking directly about anything about Bayer today, but that's, I'm guessing, one of the ways that you two connected and collaborated. Is there anything you wanted to say about the third co-author, Tracy Oliver? Yeah, Tracy is a registered dietitian, PhD uh, educator at Villanova. And she really brought, um, Cami and I <laughs> started the paper pre-COVID maybe, early COVID. Yeah. It's one of those things that just, we were working on it, talking about it and yeah, engaging. It was great. Yeah. We had done some speaking, you know, working with our bear colleague, Kelly Bristow and kind of came to a, what should we do? Let's do a paper. And as, as we were working on it, Tracy and I have done some things on critical thinking for the weight management DPG. And again, with her educator position, she brings that perspective that Cammie and I both felt would be very helpful as it relates to what is it we need to communicate to those who are educators so that they can help students really become more astute at the critical thinking and the ethics piece. So Tracy is a former weight management DPG chair. She actually, I think she might have been chair right behind me. So that's how she and I started working together but she brought a lot to the paper. Okay, great. Yes, I definitely wanted to include her in the conversation. So let's talk about the paper. Why did you decide to write this paper? You know, I think it, as Kimmy said, we had a lot of conversations for a lot of years around the perceptions of many versus the realities. And, you know, we had done a couple of speaking things together and it finally became to, you know, and when you do a speaking engagement, it's great, but you have a limited audience. How do we get this to more people? Which, of course, is why we're so appreciative of you having us on, because it is that next reach to more people. And I think that's kind of how we decided we need to do an article. And of course, I always defer to Connie and Tracy in this because I am not a registered dietitian and I have never published in the Journal of Nutrition before. So I really defer to them in better understanding where are the gaps in the literature out there And how could we fill them? And I think that a lot of the work that we did was just really what I would call strategizing around what would that audience want and get value out of. And actually, that probably took longer to do than to actually write the paper because we had to formulate that a little. But at the end of the day, if you dive into the the topic around mis and disinformation, period, across number of industries, topics, issues or whatever, It's just a burgeoning topic in that space, in that academic publishing space. So there's always gaps. There's always opportunities out there. And I think one of the things that I personally picked up on, because I follow a number of registered dietitians, very good science-based dietitians like both of you, but I also follow the wellness industry a little bit because I always find it interesting what happens. But what I was noticing, and Connie, please jump in on this, but I was noticing a lot of very legitimate registered dietitians out there. But I noticed, like many of us that are experts, when we get caught up in that social media machinery, our priorities might change. We might shift from being evidence-based as a priority to being, how can I get more attention? How can I get more likes? 
And I think that that was something that we kind of dive into a little bit in the paper. And I think that's one of the most important things that we have to explore as experts of any kind is we have to look at what is our behavior online and what is incentivizing and motivating that behavior? And ethically, what do we need to do to maybe pull back at some of those things and think slower and maybe think more critically about our own behaviors, not just about how we try to encourage others to think critically. So I think that that's something that is very interesting about that social space, virtual space that's very interesting is that it can easily shift you into maybe prioritizing things that maybe you shouldn't. Mm -hmm. No, I agree with you totally. And I also think it's important that, you know, we talked about the Journal of Nutrition from the standpoint of we touch more professions than just the RD. And we felt that was a real strong positive from the standpoint of this is a problem that permeates its society. It is not unique to us, which also makes it challenging for the RD because they look at others out there on social media who are pushing the boundaries, who are stretching the science. Well, why can't I do the same thing? Why can't I be in that same place? And let's, you know, let's be straightforward. Cammy said many times, I mean, people want likes. They want to have their social media platform all of a sudden become the social media platform. And that's great because if that's your brand, you need that piece. But you need to be sure that your brand speaks to your ethics, your science, your responsibility to the consumer. And that's really, I think, um, you know, we looked at how can, uh, maybe this is stretching a little far, but how can we help make a difference for healthcare providers out there to be more ethically responsible for how they communicate with clients? And that was our hope. Again, one small paper isn't going to change the world, but that was a hope. It's a start Mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, we are definitely going to dig into social media and this self-branding concept that you bring up in the paper that we're discussing right now. And, you know, I often say that, you know, we as dietitians, we have our work cut out for us to translate evidence-based information in a way that is not only clear and concise, but compelling. Because these self-proclaimed experts can be very compelling because they can say whatever they want. (laughs) So it's kind of not a fair fight, but, you know, we have those challenges. Yeah, we do. Right at our feet. And I think an important add to that is that challenge extends into the policy arena as well. We are being challenged as professionals as to why should we be the licensed professional versus any other nutrition credentialed individual. And unfortunately, if throughout social media, we as registered dietitians are not demonstrating why we are the science-based expert, we're going to have a harder time justifying why we should be the licensed nutrition credential. That's a great point. Okay, before we go any further, I would like to discuss the definitions of misinformation and disinformation. They certainly are becoming more common in our daily vernacular, but some people may not be familiar, especially obviously with disinformation. So can you define them and and the difference between the two? I'll take this one, Connie. I was just going to say, you do this very well. It's interesting because I think sometimes we lump those terms together. Myths and disinformation are often used interchangeably out there. And I think I've done it in the past. We all do it to a certain degree. And sometimes when we're communicating about it, we just use it interchangeably. But there is a difference. Misinformation is something that is shared out of negligence or perhaps unconscious bias or without really knowing or understanding. And it often is incomplete information. So it's without context. Uh, disinformation is significantly different. And in the literature, it is defined as information that is shared intentionally to miss and disinform. So those that create and share disinformation have a strategy and an agenda. And often that is driven by dollars, which most people don't understand because that whole economy, that attention economy, that internet economy is kind of invisible to us. We don't really see what's going on behind the algorithms, but that's often what is driving disinformation. So there's an agenda there. They're either looking to ban a product, to vilify some kind of food, and we've all seen that, or there's an intention to misinform. But these two things can work together, right? 
someone who is uh, driven or drives disinformation can take a piece of misinformation and turn it into disinformation. Likewise, misinformation or someone who is misinformed or is looking to misinform someone else, they're taking the disinformation and they're carrying it along. It may not have the intent of disinforming, but you're still providing this misinformation. So it's a very complex space. So any piece of information you have, it often just a combination of a few things, right? And it usually is completely without context. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, that intent piece helps me, you know, I think, you know, we've been dealing with misinformation forever and probably disinformation has been there, but now our eyes are open and we're more aware of it. And I do think it's helpful to, again, think about what that person's agenda might be. So obviously this is an issue because ultimately the public is misinformed and disinformed. And clearly as healthcare providers, that's concerning to us. But is there anything you wanted to call out, maybe Connie specifically about why it's an issue and why we need to worry about it as healthcare providers? Well, I think one of the things that we see, I was going to say we worry about, but we really do see this, is that when healthcare professionals maybe don't stay as on top of the literature as would be ideal, or they follow people not knowing completely the individual's, as Cami said, strategy or agenda, they're dissuaded by information. They get the misinformation and they don't know it's misinformation. That's where the critical thinking piece comes in. You know, that's certainly where our code of ethics, it says, you know, you're grounded in evidence-based practice. But what is happening is in our crazy world, we're all busy people. And as I've had many say to me, I don't have time to go read every research study. I just can't do that. It takes too much. But we need to figure out a way professionally for ourselves, how do I stay on top of science? You know, the three of us and many of your listeners know science evolves. It is not static. And we have to stay on top of the changing science so that we don't get caught in the, well, that used to be correct, so therefore it must still be correct. Or, well, that sounds pretty good, so therefore I'll go with it. And I think the other big one that, you know, gets us into a much bigger topic, but is we certainly work in great partnership. As I said, in my case, currently, in the past, I've worked with many food brands, but currently it's bare. But we work with many food brands that are bringing products to market that we need to know about. We need to know how to educate our customers, but we also need to know how to read through their marketing to be sure what we share is in fact grounded in evidence, not brand marketing. So it's crucial to our client. That's the bottom line. Mm-hmm. I mean, sure, we all could get called on an ethics charge if we're miscommunicating. But the key is, what are we doing to our client? Right. And that's who drives us first. Yes. And every time I do a presentation to a group of dietitians, I ask them, why did you want to become a dietitian? And basically the answer is always the same. I want to help people. So we want to help people. And uh, you called it out, Connie. Uh, It's a daunting task to try to keep up with the science. It is. And um, I hope we can share some specific examples or case studies as we go through today. But I'll put one of my own out there because we are certainly not pointing the finger or wagging our finger at anybody. This is something that anybody can make a mistake. Yeah. Exactly. I uh, outed myself on a recent episode um, and I'm not proud of it, but I think it's really important to say is back when I was a supermarket dietitian, and that was 20 years ago, I did promote the Dirty Dozen a little bit before I realized that it was bunk. And so it can happen to the best of us. Yeah. It can happen to anybody. And so that critical thinking aspect is really key. And we're going to touch on that. Um, In the paper and in our conversation already today, we've talked about this introduction and expansion of social media has created more opportunities, but also more challenges and really brings this problem of misinformation and disinformation to the surface. But it existed before social media. So I would love for you to maybe address what are the differences uh, between the challenges created by social media versus those that were already existing with traditional media? Or how has the traditional media landscape changed with regard to mis- and disinformation? Well, I mean, the key from my perspective is the internet, social media is 24-7. When I did television here in St. Louis, you know, I was on 
at X time. And once I was off, that was it. My pieces were not posted on any sort of internet. You know, we didn't have those kinds of things. Even uh, I went off the air here in St. Louis in 2001. So yes, it's been a long time, but there still was, you know, computer technology <laughs> at that point. But, you know, it didn't live on. Whereas in today's world, even traditional media, you can catch an episode anytime you or a newscast anytime you want. Social media is forever. It, well, not only is it forever, it's on forever and it is forever. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. That means people are being influenced all the time, mm -hmm. anytime, yes. wherever. And with traditional media, there's somewhat of a gatekeeper with the journalists, whereas with social media, we're all our own journalists. <laughs> true. I mean, it is very true. You know, we certainly are seeing traditional media. It's become more entertainment than newsy. Mm -hmm. But yes. And, and again, it all comes down to one thing. We all want to be heard. Mm -hmm. So if you're a television newscast, when you and I did the, you know, the Eating Right Minute pieces, you want to be heard. So it all comes down to how do you hook those people in? Mm -hmm. Social media just does it all the time. Mm -hmm. They do. And I'm going to just add to that a little bit, Connie, because that's the thing. To your point, Melissa, mis and disinformation aren't new. I mean, if you think about from a traditional media perspective, remember War of the Worlds back in the 1930s? I mean, that was put out there as a drama radio drama, but people heard it and they heard something else. And then there was misinformation about that misinformation that came out. So mis and disinformation aren't new, but to Connie's point, it's like everything is on hyper steroids, like everything's just crazier now. And the thing is, we only have so much attention in the day. Now, the difference is we do spend a lot of time on social media. The stats suggest that probably we spend three or more hours a day on social media. That's significant if you think about it. Mm -hmm. And to Connie's point, with traditional media at one point, you'd have, you'd get up in the morning, you might read the paper, you'd go to bed at night, you'd watch the evening news. That was it. Mm -hmm. But now you have visual cues going through and through your Facebook threads or whatever. You have the same messages and memes popping up again and again, and they become implanted in different ways because with that repeated exposure to those signals or those cues, they become more embedded in your brain in a different way and you absorb them more. So it's sort of like when you think about GMOs, like I think pretty much everybody's kind of got this consensus and I think the public's let the, you know, GMO thing go away, mm -hmm. but it's so embedded in the social psyche that we still have a whole bunch of new products coming out all the time that are labeled non-GMO. Mm -hmm. We're just there. That's just what the ex social expectation is. So I think social media has really driven a lot of that. And another just bit of statistical piece here is that 2021 represented a tipping point. It was a tipping point for societies globally because at that point, there were more people globally on social media or using social media than not. Hmm. And as a person that's worked in agriculture for as long as I have, I know that in the U.S. and Canada in around the early 1920s, that was a tipping point. There were more people living in urban areas than living in rural areas. And we know what that did for agriculture mm -hmm. and how we see food. So this just represents another social tipping point that is changing how we see the world and how we experience the world. And that's what's shaping things. And we're herd animals. Like, come on, that's what we do. In order to socially survive today, which is different than maybe thousands of years ago, in order to survive today, we have to survive socially. We have to stay embedded in our little networks or groups or personal networks. And social media is the glue that holds some of those relationships together. And we don't want to get voted off the island. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're going to follow those things. Right. And very obviously, as we went through COVID, which eliminated that social connection piece, the need to have social media became even stronger. Mm, that connection. Right. I would say, though, that another thing that happened with mis and disinformation, I think we were sort of aware that it existed out there. And I'm speaking from an ag standpoint. But I think what COVID did, it all of a sudden raised awareness about mis and disinformation. I think people around the world 
you know, not everybody feels affected by agriculture. Like what, 2% of the population are actually farmers, right? But all of a sudden you have an issue like COVID come out and all of a sudden that affects everybody. Mm -hmm. Like that went global. Then all of a sudden everybody is aware about that there is mis and or disinformation around those public health issues. So I think it raised awareness around the issue of mis and disinformation. And you can even see it in uh, the engagement of a lot of social and behavioral scientists. They're actually out there and engaging about what that means, about critical thinking. They talk about what happens with human behavior and why we act the way we do. And I think generally the public is more exposed to that kind of information than they ever have been before. So I think that's a good thing. I agree. Yeah. And a lot of the concepts that you just mentioned, Cami, I did a podcast interview back episode 100. I, I remember because I, I was like celebrating 100 episodes and now I'm like at 230 something. But it was communicating science in a modern media environment with Dietram Schäufele from mm -hmm. University of Wisconsin-Madison, who's phenomenal. So if anybody's interested in more of those nuts and bolts, we talk about narrow casting versus broadcasting. We talk about all different types of bias and heuristics and how the thinking fast and slow type um, stuff, which we're going to dive into critical thinking right now. But a lot of that is in that conversation. So I'll put a link to that in my show notes as well. So like I said, I talk about critical thinking a lot on the podcast. And it looks like we're getting more critical thinking into our schools. I talked to fourth and fifth grade students recently, and they have critical thinking uh, curriculum. Uh, the fifth graders actually, funny story is, is it's on a flavored milk debate. And uh, when my son, who's now a freshman in high school, was in fifth grade, I think I've talked about this on the podcast before, but I don't know if either one of you know this. The teacher was asking if I was the Melissa Joy Dobbins in the flavored milk video. And I said, oh, yeah, that was with my daughter, who's now 23. And she said, well, we use that in our curriculum. The kids watch your video and a Jamie Oliver video. And they do all kinds of research and they have to write a letter to the principal with their position, whether the school will keep flavored milk. And uh, they have to state their case and use their citations and everything. Um, so uh, I just think it's great that, I mean, I don't think I learned critical thinking in fourth or fifth grade. So I think that that's just wonderful. But are we getting this in our dietetics curriculum? Are we getting this in high school? Are we getting this, hopefully, you know, like I said, you know, fourth and fifth grade, we're seeing that more now. Let's talk about what it is. What is critical thinking? Um, I know uh, you referred to Jason Reese and the paper, and I've interviewed him a couple times on the podcast as well. I'll also uh, link to those episodes if people want a deeper dive into critical thinking. But let's talk about what it is and uh, how we can be more aware of our own critical thinking. You already mentioned that, Cami. Like, we need to be aware of our own critical thinking habits, if you will, and be aware that our clients, our patients, the public, uh, we can help them with that as well. You know, that's the interesting part about critical thinking is that we all need to learn and practice it. It doesn't matter what we know, what we don't know. That's a piece of all of this. And I think what tipped things over the edge, and Connie kind of alluded to this earlier, is that we're in this fast-paced world, right? We don't think slow anymore. And so you said, talk about thinking fast, thinking slow, right? My favorite behavioral economist of all time, Daniel Kahneman, and it's one of my favorite books. Critical thinking is about moderating our own behavior. It doesn't matter who we are, but we live in a world where we get rewarded for being first in line. And I think forcing ourselves to go, okay, I'm just going to stop. I'm not going to share this because I don't really know and I don't have time to look it up. So I'm just going to leave it alone. And sometimes that's really hard. I know that. I've made mistakes in the past. I probably will continue to make mistakes because we're so in that mode of, I just want to put this out here because this totally confirms my bias. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's what you have to do. It's pulling back. And we often talk, and my colleagues in social behavioral sciences get frustrated when the scientists talk this way, is that, oh, we need scientific literacy. That kind of pushes hard on people uh, from my discipline because actually that just infers that you know everything and we know nothing. Mm -hmm. And that is not true of anybody, no matter what kind of education they have. 
And I think what we need to become more grounded in as we move forward with critical thinking in kindergarten to grade 12 or in universities or amongst our expert groups is we have to start thinking about what could help us with understanding science is if we are media literate, Mm. if we have digital literacy, if we have information literacy. And I think once we start even teaching those kinds of things in schools and in spaces, that's going to lift that critical thinking action and activity as it's experienced out there. So I think we focus on the science and that's good because we have to communicate about it. But I also think that we're dealing with a whole other set of issues that are influencing our behavior. And in order to really think critically about what's in front of us, we have to be digitally literate. We have to understand, you know, how information is shared. We've got to understand at least to some level what algorithms are. We have to understand this attention digital economy in a way that will help us think more critically about what's in front of us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think one of the things that I will often do is go back to something that is ancient. But if you remember, Melissa, the 10 red flags of junk science, you know, I go back to the does it sound too good to be true? Um, It does what Kami alluded to that stop, think for a moment. What do you know versus what this is saying? And then trying, you know, to help people go from there. It really is so tempting to react to everything because disinformation typically has a nugget of truth to it. So it's hard to know that it is, in fact, not quite accurate. And so if you can do that, wait a minute, let me just think here for a moment. It often will buy you that time to make the questions or to go do the search. And I also think in terms of one of the things that the IT people at the university used to seriously like beat into our head. Do not open anything that you're not expecting, even if it's coming from someone you know. It's the same thing. Don't click on that. Don't respond to that if it's not something that sounds like what you think it should be. And don't share it. Exactly. You know, don't get in there. Give them one more click, one more like. And I don't know if it's Twitter. I think it is Twitter. Now, if you click on an article, it will ask you, do you want to read the article first? Before sharing it. Yeah. Which is a good thing from the standpoint of it gives you that moment to think about what are they saying versus what I know. Right, right. Before we continue, I want to take a moment to share something with our listeners. If you like the Soundbites podcast, then I really think you'll like the Nutrition Diva podcast by my colleague and friend, Monica Reinagel. Here's a little info for you about her show. Sometimes it can be hard to know whether or not you're eating healthy. Micronutrients, macronutrients, phytonutrients, probiotics, prebiotics, postbiotics, it's enough to make your head spin. I'm Monica Reinagel. I'm a licensed nutritionist, and I'm also the host of the Nutrition Diva podcast. On my show, I teach you how to sort food facts from fiction, the ins and outs of your metabolism, and we dive into cuisines from around the world. So whether you're looking for quick tips or you're a certified nutrition info junkie, you'll learn something new every week from the Nutrition Diva podcast. Find Nutrition Diva on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening right now. And we're back on the Sound Bites podcast with Dr. Cami Ryan and dietitian Connie Dickman. Connie, I wanted to ask you, how can practitioners recognize if they're using critical thinking when they're dealing with their clients or with research? or with the media? (laughs) Wow, that's a big question. (laughs) You know, I do believe that we need to not react when a client, well, I read X, Y, and Z, because that is our tendency. We need to do that stop. And what I will do to the client is say, tell me more about what you learned or what you read to get the information to understand where they're coming from. And then very obviously, once you get that information and you see the gaps or you see the confusion, it is appropriate to ask them, you know, could I maybe share with you what I've learned or what some of the studies I've looked at look like that are a little different than this? I guess what I'm saying very simply is have a conversation with the individual. Don't automatically shift to 
let me tell you everything I know, because that's not going to achieve the goal, which is, of course, a big part of why the three of us were big on. Let's have some charts, some tables so that people can walk away, you know, hanging on their office wall and refer to, oh, yeah, that's what I should be doing, because we all do tend to practice as we've always practiced. So there might be some changes in that process. You know, tell me what you read. Why is it you think X, Y, and Z? Now, can I share with you some more information? Building that trust. Yes. Good word. And I think that the other piece of this is that when you're in that scenario and you're you're having that engagement opportunity, whether it's a client or it's a conversation with someone, whatever, even if what they're thinking is not true, what they're feeling is completely valid. And that's where the trust bridge can be built because kind of moving the issue to the side and then just focusing on, please tell me how you feel about this or tell me more about where you're coming from in all of this, like Connie suggested. I think leaning into and validating those fears helps build that bridge and gives you that license to move forward maybe with, you know, putting forward different information. And I think that's a big part of why we did put the words, you know, relationship engagement on our tables and our charts, as opposed to a more directive type word, because it is about that engagement component. And I think in social media, people forget, because you don't have the person in front of you, that there are people behind all these posts. And as soon as you react, respond, whatever it might be, there is an engagement that takes place. And you need to be thinking in terms of, is my message what I would communicate to them if they were sitting right here in the same room with me. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's what something we've lost with social media as well is you get these very, of course, 140 characters doesn't help, but you get these very short, direct, curt responses. You don't build a relationship or an engagement or trust when you do that. Right, right. And the charts you're referring to is that some of the figures and the images, and we're going to talk about those. I'm going to have you share some of that when we talk about applying this. But as you're talking, I, I turned to the paper because I wanted to read under providing guidance to clients. It says judgments are typically made quickly, yet our intuitions often feel very strong. We do not generally feel an urge to self-reflect on these intuitions. So we are often wrong without knowing it. So I wanted to read that from the paper because it speaks to uh, what you were saying, especially you, Cami. You know, we could talk all day about critical thinking. And it is, uh, you know, again, it's one of those concepts that is easier recognized or said than practiced. So I think it's a kind of an ongoing uh, learning curve there. But when it comes to putting that into place, you mentioned a little bit about code of ethics, Connie. So I wanted to know what more you can talk about and share with us with regard to the code of ethics and also identifying responsibilities of practitioners, because I have a lot of questions about this myself. Yeah. If we really were to walk through our code of ethics, it really does very clearly talk about our responsibility is to communicate accurate information. Our responsibility is to not mislead. There you go with that mis and disinformation. We need to look very closely at, am I being too tantalizing and potentially misleading someone? And that is a part of our code of ethics. You know, it does talk also in terms of the critical thinking piece from the standpoint of recognizing the differences in people. You know, you get two clients in your office or again on Facebook, Twitter with two different interactions. The message you give may be totally different. And we need to be sure that we are adjusting the messaging, the comments, the instruction to meet the needs of the client. You know, it is about the client piece. That doesn't often get carried over in my view, strictly in my view, to social media. Because again, we think in terms of it's fraud, it's everyone out there, what's the big deal? No, it's still within, if we speak anywhere as a registered dietitian, whether you're an Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics member or not, if you are credentialed by CDR, Commission on Dietetic Registration, you must abide by the Code of Ethics. And that code covers social media. And so therefore, we need to be cautious if I were to say something on any social media platform as it relates to a bare product, I've got to declare 
that, you know, it's a sponsored post that I am a part of that. We've got to do that. Clients lose their trust when we are hesitant to disclose. Mm -hmm. My students, I think they've stopped laughing, but they kind of chuckle at me because my slides in class, the disclosure slide is often, you know, kind of long. And it's like, well, this has nothing to do with the lecture you're giving. It's like, that's okay. You at least know where I'm affiliated. And therefore, you have no questions about what I bring to the conversation. Mm -hmm. So that code of ethics, and it's, this is true with all professions. They're different. Codes are different. You know, ours is grounded in the international code of the International Confederation or the International Congress. I always get my ICDA mixed up, but of dietetic associations. So that kind of is the big code. And then the academy falls from there. But you look at any medical profession and you have a code of ethics. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, you touched on something that I'm constantly saying. Well, you said it's my personal opinion. I agree with you that when we're working with a client or a patient one on one, we can have that conversation. We can ask questions. We can really tailor everything to them. But when we try to translate that to mass communications, whether it's traditional media or social media, we do tend to get general and maybe oversimplify or things get lost in translation and are taken out of context. And so it's a very challenging aspect of us yeah. nutrition and science communicators. But Melissa, to just kind of add to that, I think that's our opportunity to say what you exactly said there at the end, that, you know, science is complicated and there is a lot to it. Let me talk to you about, you know, I'm posting on this one piece. I can do more. You're right. You are totally right. Okay, great. I'm on the right track. So as a follow up to that, then, you know, when it comes to translating research into recommendations, we often hear or believe that the public wants definitive black and white information, black and white answers. But oftentimes it's a very complex and nuanced message or concept. So if we try to simplify it, that could result in it being oversimplified and in my opinion, unhelpful. Can we build trust with the public by trying to communicate the complexities instead of trying to simplify? Or does that make the public trust us less because, well, there's too many gray areas. You don't know the answer. I don't trust you. You are correct. It's, and it's funny you bring this up because there's actually a conversation on one of the social media platforms today about this very topic. Oh, my approach and what I do educate, because I do teach a class on interpreting and translating science for consumers. So my message to my students in that class is that we need to share with the client or on social media a little bit about here's what the evidence shows. But if you look at this in practical terms, here's what it might mean. So yes, I mean, we talk about translating the textbook to the table. If we can't do that science translation, and I mean translated, I don't mean sit there and go, well, then the, the research method was this and they had this many people. And, you know, no, that's not what the consumer wants. They want to trust that we know the science, we understand the science, and we can help them figure out what to eat because that's what they want to know. Mm -hmm. But we've got to stop, you know, being ignore the science, because, again, I'll go back to what we said earlier. If they don't want the science, they're going to go get it from anybody on social media who proclaims to be a nutrition expert. Mm -hmm. It's true. And oftentimes people don't even understand where expert lines exist, right? Like where your lines of expertise exist. I've always been very careful about what I talk about in the agricultural world because I'm not an agronomist. I'm not a plant geneticist. And you really have to communicate where your expert lines exist. And I think that that's also a challenge for all of us as experts. We have to be open and honest about that. The other thing I want to pull into this, and this is something that I think is a really important issue, and I'm pretty sure that you both would agree, is that science, general, thinks that it stops after publication. And what we've been trying to do, especially internally, or at least in agriculture more broadly, is these great scientists that do this great research and do this great work and publish it in peer-reviewed journals, which is great. And there's also junk journals out there, which we've come to learn. But they're publishing good stuff. That's not where it ends. You have to, as a scientist today, be able to talk about your science. And that is not natural for scientists. 
as scientists, you know, there's a reason why we call it the ivory tower. It's because we want to stay removed from society so we can study society. That's just being objective, right? Well, we no longer have that privilege. That's not what the public wants. So now all of a sudden you're seeing shifts even in academic journals where they're going, okay, this is great. We love your paper. We've peer reviewed it and we're going to publish it. But you have to do a visual abstract. We want you to get on camera and do a 30 second to one minute blurb about what this paper means. And then the expectation for us as a company, when our scientists do all this great work with some of their partners at universities, we want them out there talking about it. Just like what we're doing with you today, Melissa. Bayer wants us out there talking about this because this is where people go to listen, to understand. So this is part of that translation process, which science has never been really great at. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's another learning curve that has to happen. And I think we're beginning to see that evolve a little bit now, too. And that reminds me of how farmers didn't want to communicate and we impressed upon them the importance of getting their voice into the conversation and that their work and their stories matter so much. So when it comes to the responsibilities of practitioners, do we as dietitians, for example, need to do something if we see another dietitian spreading myths or disinformation? What is our charge? Is the onus on us? Is there a role that the academy plays in this? I mean, I know that we have this, like if we see a non-credentialed person practicing medical nutrition therapy, but what would you say to that question, Connie? Um, we do have a responsibility. It is a part, um, I forget it, exactly what it says in the code, but it is a part of the code to hold each other accountable is pretty much the terminology. And there is a process by which through the academy, we can file ethics complaints. One of the things the Academy does encourage is that before we go to that point, we as colleagues try to discuss it with each other. Not on social media. No, not on. <laughs> Just <laughs> put it out there. <laughs> no, probably not the best place to do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Our brains are going in the same place. I just had to say it. I know. No, and seriously, it's an important thing to say because that is not where we should be discussing it. You know, it should be an approach to each other and, and obviously in a collegial manner. You know, I noticed you posted X, Y, and Z. I'm concerned about that because it doesn't follow what I've learned. Can you share with me what you're basing that on? You know, clearly, if the process escalates from there with denial or refusal to discuss, then you might say, okay, time to file a complaint. Because remember, we all carry the same credential. Uh -huh. Okay, we all carry the same credential. If one person abuses it, it has an impact on all of us. Mm -hmm. And we've got to protect that credential, which is why, again, it's so important to say, you know, anybody who has that CDR credential, you've got to abide by that code of ethics. Mm -hmm. It is a part of you carrying that credential. So, you know, that is one piece. The other piece is, of course, licensure. In many states, and I do sit, I guess I should have said this at the top, I do sit on the Missouri State Committee of Dietitians, which is our licensure board. And we do get, fortunately not a lot, but we do get complaints about things that dietitians in the state are doing that other members are questioning. Because yes, our licenses are grounded in our credential as well. Now again, states are different, so everybody may not do it the same way. But here in Missouri, that is a part of what the um, licensure committee does follow. Good to know. Where can people find out more about that in the Code of Ethics? For sure. You know, if you, and maybe because I Google it too much, but, it, you know, if you Google Code of Ethics um, Academy, it comes right up as a link. Clearly, it's also on eatright.org. Okay, great. And our paper is open access, too. So all of those links are in there. But you know what I want to add to this? And again, I'm speaking as a non-registered dietitian. I want to challenge us all, whether we're dietitians or whatever area we're in. Why don't we elevate what this whole online social media circus is about? We can take our ethics, follow them, and follow the evidence, follow the science, and try to rebuild ways to build our brand in ethical ways. Like, I think sometimes we're sitting here going, well, this is wrong, this is right, or that person's not credentialed this. 
But as networks or societies or group of individuals that are experts that are trying to do the right thing, let's try to experiment with ways that fulfill the ethical part and our obligations to our clients, to the public, but also helps you build your brand. Because I do believe that you can do it. I think what we've been living in for the last several years is basically the wild west of social media. (laughs) It's a whole new type of society. It's a new space where we interact as human beings. And there are no road signs. There's no patrol cars. There are no lines down the middle of the road to guide you on your way. We're just beginning to build the etiquette around this. And I think what we have is a lot of people taking advantage of that and building brands motivated by likes and dollars and whatever to do this. But I think we are building this society that is obviously not going to go away unless we have some sort of world collapse of communications. It's going to be there. But I think we're going to build towards this. But I think it's people like you, Melissa, and you, Connie, in your area of expertise of encouraging your counterparts to build their brand in a way that also follows the ethical protocols that have been built. Okay. Great point. So when it comes to providing guidance to clients, there are three figures or charts in the paper that we referred to briefly earlier. So I would love for you to talk us through some of those. And yes, the paper is open access and I'll have a link to it in my show notes at soundbitesrd.com, of course. But there's three charts, client and clinician scientist engagement pathway, the client and clinician scientist relationship and the clinician scientist checklist for ethical practice. Can you just briefly give us an overview of those? And I mean, they're, we can't see the visuals, but uh, they're in the paper so people can access that. But walk us through those. You want to walk the first one, Tammy? Well, I was kind of hoping you would take all three of them. But what I remember mostly is when we were discussing this paper, we were thinking, one, readability. And we were going, what are we going to put out there in a way that people would be able to print off and it was easily understood? So I felt like we did the three things to fill three gaps. And that's probably where I'm at with this, because you and Tracy really helped to flesh out what the content of those things were. That's a great point, Cami. And, and, you know, it was that visual to support the word. I think people, if they go to the paper, what they'll see, especially in the engagement pathway, what we've talked about, they'll see, I mean, right, almost dead center, not quite, but is empathy. You know, right below that is trust. There's another on trust. So it's about, you know, how do you ensure that those things with the arrows going back and forth, if this happens, then here's what you need to do to ensure you maintain that trust or ensure that, you know, you demonstrate empathy. Let's be real. You know, that is what people want. They want that somebody cares about me. They really are listening, hearing me. And the same thing holds true as you look at the relationship figure from the standpoint of that we see on social media and that we hear from clients all the time. You know, I'm afraid of carbohydrates. I'm afraid of, you know, gluten. I don't want to eat whatever it might be. You know, instead of us automatically thinking, well, carbohydrates are perfectly fine. Why should you be afraid of them? It's that stop, listen, hear, and then come back with those. Well, what scares you? What is it that makes you uncomfortable? Let's talk about that. So it's working you through establishing that real connection so that the client isn't uncomfortable, that they're going to be judged because you're a registered dietitian and I know what that means. And I'm coming to you with things I got off of social media and you're probably going to think, I don't know what I'm doing. And then finally, the checklist for ethical practice really ties to that code of ethics piece, you know, where it talks in terms of, you know, make sure you are doing what you do based upon the evidence. You know, are you critically looking at what you read? Are you questioning? Are you taking that minute to think like we discussed a few minutes ago? And then making sure that, you know, when you do things, you don't stretch the boundaries of truth or in this case, the boundaries of facts. You know, don't infer something to get that like or that click or whatever it might be. And then finally, the one that you know, we talked a lot about it in the paper and it's at the bottom on the checklist is really looking at the emotion piece because it's easy for us to have, as Cami has said, our own biases and to develop it not only in the words, but in the facials. You know, the client says, I don't eat carbs because they're bad. And, we, you know, the eyes go rolling. You know, it's making sure that we keep those emotions in check. 
And also remember, you know, to ask permission if we're going to share something that the client has already said, I've learned, I think, and we're going to share something that contradicts it, that's a put down. Mm -hmm. And making sure that, you know, well, can I give you some information that I've learned to see what you think about it? So as Cammie said, the real hope, though, was that people would see these as good visual reminders hanging on that wall, which might also be a plus for your client who sees, wow, you care about the relationship. You know, it's not going to translate the visual to social media, but hopefully the behavior will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just to add to that, I think what that third checklist does for me, if I look at and use it, that's my excuse to slow down, right? If I read something and my immediate thought is I'm going to share this, Just reading through the checklist reminds me to slow down and then think about what I'm going to do with that piece. If anybody even just uses it for that, to think about sharing something on social media, I think that that's good. And just to further to your point, Connie, there's two editions of the debunking handbook out there. And Melissa, I'm happy to send you a link to the latest one. But one of my longtime mentors and colleagues, uh, Stephen Lewandowski, uh, John Cook out of University of Melbourne, and there's a few others that are involved in the second one. The great thing that I learned out of actually the first one that they've expanded upon the second is that if you present a piece of information that shakes the ground beneath people's beliefs, they're more apt to kind of ignore you and go back to their beliefs because that's comfort. And that's also where their networks are. They don't want to get voted off the island, like I said before. But what the debunking handbook suggests is that, yes, part of the process is, yes, you address the piece of misinformation or disinformation. If you're trying to pull a piece of information out of someone's head about their belief system and you don't have a narrative to replace that, someone else is going to fill that in. So it's not just about replacing it with a fact. You have to replace it with this narrative that makes sense, that you've connected that to, meaning that that narrative has to be relationship-driven. That has to be about an authentic and engaging dialogue and discussion that's commitment to the person and putting that relationship first, because then you will be allowed to share with them that narrative that can replace something that you've debunked. And I like the way they formulate their thinking and how they articulate it in the handbook. Handbook's like three or five pages long, so it's really easy to kind of consume. But I love how they say that because oftentimes when in the past we would go, well, what do you mean carbs? There's nothing wrong with carbs. Yeah. Because let me tell you, this percentage, this and this and that, that doesn't work. Right. They don't want that, Mm -hmm. but they will respond to a story that you can tell about carbs. So let me tell you something that I learned or my experience, because I used to do this. People love that. They want to hear about you. They want to hear your story. Yeah. And I think Connie's point about the question, what scares you about this or what are your concerns about this can really help open that door to help you tailor that story, that narrative to that person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I will add that debunking handbook to my sound science toolkit. I've already added your paper to the toolkit. Thank you. It's just a curation of articles, videos, books, anything related to how to understand nutrition and science research better, how to translate it, how to communicate it, understanding critical thinking, understanding a variety of biases, including confirmation bias and so on. So I really do encourage people to check that out. As we're wrapping up, I want you both to share where people can find more information about you and follow you on social media and any parting words of wisdom about this topic? Website is pretty simple. C-B-D-I-E-K-M-A-N.com. I am on Twitter. C-B Dickman. Those would be the places to find me. And any parting words of wisdom? You know, I think in terms of us as professionals, remember, clients come first, hear their needs, help them achieve their goals by sharing what we know, but remember that it is their life goals, not our goals for them. And, you know, certainly for the people we work with, as Melissa said, we are here to help people eat healthier, enjoy what they eat, and feel good about it. So therefore, ask questions, challenge us, feel comfortable to have dialogue, not just be told what to do. Great. And Cami, 
Well, I'm pretty easy to find. I am Cami D. Ryan on most social media platforms. I'm information wrangler on TikTok. Yes, I'm on TikTok, if you can believe it. <laughs> I have a blog also to a website. It's uh, camiryan.com. So pretty easy to find. Parting words, I would say, no matter where we work, what we do, we have to continuously demonstrate trustworthy behavior. And I think modeling critical thinking, thinking slow, just demonstrating that behavior and moderating and monitoring our own responses in this weird space and this weird social media life, I think that goes a long way in building trust with people. Uh, so I would say that that's probably something that I've had to learn to do because I think I was one of those people too. I got a little caught up in what I knew or thought I knew without considering how other people felt. So the empathy piece comes with also not only being empathetic and being authentic in your engagement, but also just in your day-to-day -day life. And if you are on social media, continuously think about how do I act ethically? How do I demonstrate trustworthy behavior? Put that first. Mm -hmm. Put that before branding. That becomes your brand. Mm, I love it. Yeah. Yes. I often say this in my media trainings. You know, we see these sensational headlines that are not bottom line takeaways for people. So us as dietitians and communicators, we need to create our headlines that are compelling, but also bottom line takeaways for people. So yep. hopefully that will resonate with our listeners as well. Thank you both so much for sharing your time with me today and for writing this paper. And thank you to Tracy Oliver as the co-author as well. As I mentioned, all the links to everything we talked about will be in my show notes at soundbitesrd.com. And I encourage people to follow you and connect with you as well. Thanks, Melissa. This was great. Really appreciate it. Loved it. Thank you, Melissa. It was wonderful. And Connie, great to see your face again, too. I know. And I miss you here in St. Louis. Miss you. My pleasure to you both. And for everybody listening, as always, enjoy your food with health in mind. Till next time. For more information, visit soundbitesrd.com. This podcast does not provide medical advice. It is for informational purposes only. Please see a registered dietitian for individualized advice. Music by Dave Burke, produced by JAG and Detroit Podcasts. Copyright Soundbites Inc., all rights reserved.